Hey guys, welcome to Loudly Creative again. Today, super exciting day for me. We have a book review. Yes, indeed. It's been a while. Been reading a lot. Today I finished up The History and Theory of Rhetorics. An introduction. This is the fourth edition. And the writer, which generated the compilation of the facts that I'm about to narrow down for you, is James A. Herrick for Hope College. It's uh, the Pearson edition, and I picked up this book. It was in my brother's closet. Just stretched the hand and grabbed the thinnest book I could find as I chose my random pick of the month, and it eventually led to the reaching of my summer with a excellent theoretical and historical fact on premises within what rhetoric really means. Basically, the book is about defining rhetoric in 300 pages. Uh, it's, I guess it'd be better to look it up on the dictionary. Either or, I'm not trying to be uh, funny here, it basically takes us through the history from the start from pagan uh, beginnings before Christianity set in, which would be the Greco-Roman uh, times, where we go through the beauty of the prose uh, which is given by the classical philosophers and the dualistic dichotomy that exists between those who believe that philosophy and rhetoric are the same, whereas dialect is really the real shared asset they might hold still to this day if we take it back to that time. We talk about Aristotle, he talks about Aristotle, uh, Plato, Socrates, a little bit of each. Plato's, for example, the most intriguing thing I found and I will develop soon, shortly in each uh, chapter that's going to be covered. I'm going to cover the 11 chapters in the book on separate videos so that if you're doing a research project maybe on Aristotle or, or uh, Plato's um, The Republic, you can find divergence within the opinions of an author that developed the whole issue of rhetoric or the speaking out loud about everything that surrounds us in the universe to obtain truth. So that'd be the premise on the Greco-Roman uh, search after that Christianity kicked in. We also have, I'm sorry that was a little fast, the Romans had a lot of influence with Cicero. Uh, and now I'm just going to quote a few of, of the greats. We have, for example, uh, Plato which actually is always in search of the truth within uh, the being, and he believes that persuading uh, through rhetoric would be an erroneous use of uh, the possibilities within justice. Uh, Aristotle also celebrates the fact that justice cannot be achieved if one has not had the experience to defend the principle of justice itself. Later on, there is an expansion on uh, philosophers such as Georgius, uh, which is actually the creator of the famous phrase that says that nothing exists. If anything did exist, we couldn't know. If we could know, we wouldn't be able to communicate it, which left me thinking about the initial evolution or chronological development of a premise. Further on, it is also developed within uh, the proof of burden during the Enlightenment. And in the end, we have Burke and Falkalt's uh, philosophy on modern times within imagery. But I think I left a gap for the Renaissance and um, how with uh, Gutenberg's uh, press uh, it was more of a concern to bring pagan notions into the acceptance of the overwhelming uh, Christian movement which is overall also seen in Tolstoy and has a little bit to do with this I saw a lot of references to towards Tolstoy's uh, pattern of thought, where the struggle to find Christian uh, dissemination within our culture after pagan uh, elimination was considered a very frightful issue in the development of law, rhetorics, dialect, scholarism, and classicist movements. Everything I've just mentioned is just a brief uh, opening in, of the back and forth possibilities you might obtain with this book by James A. Herrick. There is also 
Protagoras, I got to quote him, classical philosopher who defines rhetoric, and he says that the man or men, and when he says men, we must always consider women to be a part of humans, which is actually the correction I would make in modern times instead of saying man, back in those times maybe there wasn't as much feminist movements to write and compose opinions throughout uh, the principle of their own ideology not tied to uh, man's rootings or premise, which is a word that comes up to mind a lot after reading this, the logical axiom of something that is not disputed but leads to the argument that develops conversation and growth within the possibility to express oneself without having to judge one's own opinion on the dualistic possibility of realizing that every thought that is pardon me followed too much excitement followed by the previous thought may be a contradiction but if we consider this we will not be able to move along on the what we believe is building of an idea that may be put in use however more in the going back to Protagoras Protagoras said that man is a measure of all things of those things that are not we are not and of those things that we are we will be and this is basically uh, Shakespearean uh, enlightenment uh, in the future where he says to be or not to be that is the question it all comes back to the start where no matter how hard we run away from it we will realize that persuasion or as in Latin I've learned a little Latin from this book uh, movere or to move or delectare to delight or maybe docere to uh, teach or instruct I also learned a word such as logo which is actually the symbol unit of a meaning within the structure of what we considered a norm in accepting society colors symbolisms Saint Augustine made an appearance where he says that in the infinite world of God how can men aspire to make out of finite measures which would be symbols a description of divine infinitism uh, it was poetically uh, added by my senses of what I made through his wordings but I'm trying to quote but when I quote in memory the paraphrasing of it uh, with the addition of the other books I've been reading merges and makes my rhetoric of what I understand rhetoric to be the reality in question for me as a certainty either or uh, this is an excellent book I'll try to keep it short uh, it touches a lot of themes from like I said before from Aristotle's uh, Socrates death to Isocrates as the father of writing uh, of composition and rhetorics and how we must uh, go about in teaching it there is also uh, the mm, the pentad or the five initial keys to modern uh, recent modern uh, plan of action where society is broken down into action uh, motive, uh, scene, and advocacy. And I'm missing one. Act, action, oh, and, and the subject, obviously. So basically, it's very interesting. Uh, it distanced the mind from the mundane. It actually makes you understand that rhetoric is so deep that one word may not be able to be described in its essence of understanding under the compilation of 300 pages and the uh, breaking down, narrowing down, finding of, searching with, in guiding reference at stake of past historical inferences on our today's cultural reality, which not far from is still the burden of proof we must fight to uphold within the premise of our notions to react in conversation communication is key in imagery which is the ending note of the book it doesn't matter if I tell you what the book is from getting 
started to end because there's so much to make sense of personally that there's no way that rhetoric can mean the same for me as it might mean to you. Whatever it is, all these authors gathered here, uh, for example, Capella, uh, which is a man that I found to inspire me by saying that there are seven routes in life, four of them, uh, which are the quietrivium, the four roads of uh, rhetoric, classicism, and human struggle to become better through education, which are, they're not memory, but I'm, I'm actually laughing about the fact that memory is uh, one of uh, the Roman uh, principles or basis, is Quintilian's basis is on, on imagery for the future of development in language. But going back to Capella, he says that the four roads are arithmetic, geometry, astrology, and the one I find most beautiful, which actually sounds like music, is harmonics. Combining those are the four roads to, uh, to education. And then he says that the other three roads are logic, rationality, and rhetorics. And uh, just like uh, that author, uh, which he actually structurized in, in the core of what he meant through the evolution of time and how he filled in the gaps of what progressed for the future, I would actually recommend this book uh, increasingly, or any book on rhetorics that may open up a channeling of your realization that colors, corners, edges, fears, motions, and emotions are all a part of rhetorics. And life is the only yet but more than any a rhetorical question. We must not complicate ourselves with finding an answer. For in that phrasing that I have built up thanks to the knowledge of other men, I still find the reason of a beating heart to understand that at least in my personal notions, there is much more than matter at hands within our souls. This has been Loudly Creative. Breaking down today, James A. Herrick's book titled The History and Theory of Rhetorics, an Introduction, 4th Edition, Hope College, Pearson's Edition, representing my brother's random pick from my hand, Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed this. And we will actually cover this book. I'll break this book down in chapters. There will be 11 uh, sub set of themes starting out soon. For example, with chapter one, an overview of rhetoric, which is basically the school of sophist sophis thought and uh, introduction of the questionings that they will be uh, submitting to uh, the future development of the other 10 chapters. We'll have them on the link if you're doing a research project or working around rhetoric, philosoph philosophical notions, past historical evolution of uh, classicism, renaissance, thought. Please be sure to search uh, under my channel's uh, bar because you might be able to find if the date has allowed me uh, further study on each uh, following chapter. Thank you. See you later.